Welcome, friends, to this uh, second half of the second day of our three-day event here in Wisconsin, Rice Lake. Very happy to see you all. I see you very happy. Lunch must have been good. <laughs> in the morning session, we concluded by saying that what is true meditation is meditation done with love and devotion. The question can also arise, has it to be meditation with love and devotion or is love and devotion by itself enough? The truth is love and devotion itself is enough. If you have a perfect living master who has come to your life because of your seeking for the ultimate true home and you are drawn by that love and are devoted and have this feeling of love and devotion all the time, you are meditating all the time. But if your mind is active and has questions, then you must meditate. And to make meditation successful, meditate with the best love and devotion that you can express in meditation. I just hinted that you can even ask the master to do meditation for you. But did you know that if you have that kind of faith based upon experience, not blind faith, based on experience that master can do anything for you, then he will do not only meditation for you, he will also do all the other work you are doing in life, including doing your jobs in the office, including running your business, including handling your relationships, including quarreling and fighting with people. <laughs> you will find that the master is somebody far more than you realize. My good friend, Dr. Isher Singh, told me, we have not recognized our master, no matter how hard we think, how hard we try to say who he is, he still looks like an ordinary be being. We think he has something higher, but we don't know who he is. We do not realize he is express expression of our true ultimate self, our own self which you're searching for, manifesting as a human being outside. Very difficult to understand or to accept that, but that is the truth. He said we have not recognized him, but the more, oh, Higher we go, the more we recognize. Eventually we recognize that you are just our own expression in this physical world, expression of our own true self in the physical world. So that is why we have to deal with situations based upon what our current awareness is, what our current knowledge is. We are sitting in this physical world, looks very real. We have made it look real. It didn't become real by itself. We made sure it looks real. We took several steps to make this physical reality absolutely real and also exclusively real. What steps did we take? First, we cut off our awareness of other realities, confined to one reality. We don't know others are all imagination or they exist or don't exist, no idea. A big way to focus attention only on one reality. And then we made it look like the proof of a reality lies within that reality, not outside. We want to find out, is this cup of water real? Yes. How? I can touch it, I can taste it. Real experiences, nobody can deny that I'm having the experience. It's not an artificial, un unreal experience, it's real. This experience of my being able to touch the glass and drink water is real. Confirms the reality of this whole world. I can touch this table, it's solid, real. I am using the reality which we are testing out 
with that same reality itself. Now imagine, supposing I had a dream that what I'm doing now, I was doing in the dream. And there I have also a glass of water next to me. And I'm sitting on a table. And I want to know, is it a dream or is it real? I touch the glass of water, the same way I touch this one. I drink the sip, sip of water, tastes good. I touch the table, it's real, solid. And then I wake up. Neither table was there, nor glass was there, nor water was there. But the experience of the glass, the experience of the water, the experience of the table was there. Remember, this is very important. Experience is real. And from that, we jump to the conclusion that what we are experiencing is also real. In the Indian scriptures, they refer to this world of reality as Maya. And we translate that word Maya as illusion. Very poor translation. Illusion means we know it's not real. That means we are regarding even the experience of this world as not real by calling it illusion, which is incorrect. The experience is real. We're having it. You can't deny having an experience that is not taking place. It is taking place. Experience is real, but the fact that from that experience we jump to the conclusion, the objects that are in the experience are also real, that's Maya, that's illusion. It's a very subtle difference. All experience is always real, because we're having it. Nobody can deny it. Experience is real, and from that we jump to the conclusion, things are real. And I've just given you an example. I could have the same experience in a dream, it'll look real. When I wake up, it'll look unreal. This world looks real because we have not have the experience of waking up. If we wake up from this experience, this will also become like a dream. Are we dreaming all the time? Once I was invited by the Theosophical Society. They discussed these things. Are we living in dreams or are we living in reality? So I said, depend on the definition of a dream. You define a dream as something that your mind can create and which you think is real but is not real, then even this is a dream. No difference between the dream we have in sleep and this dream, this we are having in a higher state of wakefulness where we are sleeping and having this dream. <coughs> when we wake up there, we discover it was dreamlike. Now imagine, I have a dream at night in which I meet 100 people. They've all come to have dinner and a big conference with me, 100 people. I feel I know five or ten of them. They were, I knew them before. Very familiar faces, very familiar. Ask them their names. Yeah, they are, those are the people I know. And then I find 90 people there who don't know, but they are there in the dream. Then I wake up and I find those 10 I felt I knew in the dream were also there in the physical world. And they were my friends. That is why I dreamt about them. What about the remaining 90, which I didn't know? I created them for the sake of having a dream in those 10. So it became a big conference and a big party. Is, will it be correct to say that in my dream, 10 were real and 90 were not, although all were a dream? Yes, we can say that. Because when you wake up, those people are still there, that means they were real. And we dreamt about them in the dream. It doesn't mean they are not real in the wakeful state. They were real in the wakeful state. They were real in the dream. Ninety were created. Now, supposing I create seven billion people in a dream, and I know only 1,000 out of them, and the billions of them are living in a world. I travel around, I meet, and I don't know them. But they all like different faces, different cultures, different languages speaking. And I say, they are all real. 
and those thousand I know personally are also equally real. And I wake up. I wake up and find out of seven billion, only one thousand were really there because they were there in wakeful state. The remaining billions I made up for the sake of the dream. It would be appropriate for me to say, in my dream, I had some people who were actually real, but not here. They are real somewhere else. But they are appearing here because they are real somewhere else. And the remaining seven billion are only part of the dream. And they don't exist anywhere else. And supposing I find this is also the state of affairs now that we are seeing billion, seven billion people in this world. And we personally know 1,000. And we wake up and find in the highest wakeful state, those 1,000 are there, but not the remaining. That means those 1,000 are real here also, because they are also real somewhere else when we wake up. Supposing out of them, out of the 1,000 that are there, which are also in the dream, also in the wakeful state, and I sleep, I wake up again to higher wakeful state and discover that the higher state I woke up first time was also a dream. And I wake up and find out of those 1,000, only 10 were real. 10 are still there. It's appropriate to say those 10 are real in the causal plane, are real in the astral plane, in the physical plane, because they consistently appeared. The rest were made up for the sake of the creation, illusion. Then we wake up further and discover there are only two. The rest were made up for the dreams. Then we find that I and my master were real because even when I wake up fourth time, they're still there. Others were all made up for the sake of successive layers of dreams. I finally wake up and find only one the same one looked like master and me in the, in the lower dream was actually only one and that one has been there in my dreams in my wakeful state in my astral wakeful state in my causal wakeful state and ultimately my spiritual state and state of totality therefore when we say we are sitting here is anybody real no they are all part of the same dream or illusion but it's not true. And some people who are here, if they are also there, they are more real than the others who are made up. Ultimately, only one is real, who is there at all times. And who is that? The self. The same self that you are feeling now is yourself. It's amazing that you feel you have a self that's listening, self that's experiencing, Self that dreams, self that wakes up, self that does everything, that self is there in every level, right to the top. Same self. Same self in the dream. Same self will be a dream within a dream if you have same self, same dreamer, always one dreamer, right to the top. Only one dreamer, one self. But the rest are created to create a reality of all the selves as if there are many, and they are being created this way. It's a very interesting subject. If you study carefully, what is Maya? Maya is a real experience generated, not illusion, a real experience generated of the many, yet there is only one generating the experience because it's dreamlike. If you fully understand, you'll fully understand the modus operandi, how the creation took place. You fully understand everything and all questions you ever had, how this created, how we are many, get answered by these simple experiences of going to the ultimate one dreamer. The truth is there's only one dreamer. The rest are all layers of dreams <coughs> and the reality of each dream has been created by shutting us off. But what happens if you are finally awake as the one? You can remember all the dreams. Then you are shut off from nothing. Because 
a dream does not take place outside. It takes place within you. When we sleep at night and have a dream, we are out in a big forest. Where is the forest? Inside our head. We are traveling somewhere. Where are we traveling? Inside our head. The whole dream is being created inside us, not outside. This creation is being created the same way, inside us, not outside. Looks real because we test our reality from the experience we're having and matching another experience of the same level. And then saying, because I can have sensory perceptions, I can touch, taste, smell, they have to be real. But the same thing you can do in a dream and still remain in the dream. The only way to know is a dream or not is to wake up. There's no other way. When you wake up, the whole thing becomes illusion, except the dreamer, the self who had the dream. He's still real. Self will be real at all times, no matter how high you rise up. Each reality we have created by shutting off the other realities, by creating the proof that we need for establishing its reality, touching one part of experience by another part of the experience in the same reality. If we could go to an outer reality, it would be all right. We say this shadow, this is not shadow. But we are touching on the same level of experience to generate our sense of reality. Why did we do this? If we did it, or I did it, or self did it, why? Because if you have to generate a variety of experiences, you don't want to generate illusions, you want to generate reality. And this is a need of consciousness. A need of consciousness. Consciousness has no need, they say, but it develops a need and it puts on other experiences like the experience of the mind and generates a need for having a variety of experiences, diversification. And yet we want the diversification to be real. But we don't only make this reality, even within this life. The desire to make something unreal real is still in us. And we show it when we go and watch a movie. When you watch a movie, there is no actor there. There is no real person at all. Those are pictures, shadows on a screen. <coughs> Those are shadows on a screen which you think are real. Something is going to happen. Could be a murder going to take place. Do you know you can watch the people around you in a movie all sitting on edge, what will happen? A real murder going to take place. We know nothing is going to take place. We also know that what is being shown on the screen has been shot much earlier. Film is right inside the projector behind us, we still are taking it as real at that time. Good things are happening, we laugh at them. Bad things are happening, we cry. We have a tendency to make illusions to reality and somehow this tendency is very enlarged by using a mind. There was a puppet, puppeteer. I saw his puppet show. He was wearing a puppet on his hand, like a glove, and made the puppet talk like this. And he said to the audience, please remember during this show, it's a puppet. It's not real. And please don't forget this. In the show, the puppet gets angry because the puppet says, I'm going to sing a song in French. The puppeteer says, you can't sing it because I don't know French. He says, who cares? <laughs> who asked you about it? He says, look, you are a puppet, and you cannot do something that I cannot say. He said, don't be so stupid, don't be so arrogant. He says, look, you are a puppet. He says, if I am a puppet, why are you arguing with me? <laughs> okay, I'm going to take you into a box and lock you up. And he locks the puppet in the box, Puppet cries, please help. The whole audience says, please take him out. <laughs> what is this? What happens to us? We like to make dreams into realities, and this stays with us at all times. 
movies take place? If you see movies often, and therefore you know they are movies, but still we are moved by a movie. I first thought the word movie has been designed because still pictures make moving things because they are shown rapidly. There are no moving things at all in a movie. They are still pictures shown one after the other, but they are shown so fast. The persistence of vision is creating a feeling that they are moving. But now I find, no, they are called movies because they move us. They move us emotionally. And why are we interested in going to see something that makes us cry, makes us emotional? Answer was given by a Greek philosopher more than 2,000 years ago. His name was Aristotle. Aristotle said that we need to see a drama because when the characters play, something in us identifies with those characters. And we release our own emotions because we identify with the characters. It's a human necessity. He says we do not know how to hold our emotions in. Therefore, we have to create an artificial drama. And we know it's not real, but we forget at that time it's real. And what he calls a willing suspension of disbelief. He says we willingly suspend. We would normally say, I can't believe. But we willingly shut that down, our system, so that there can be a purgation of emotions. There can be a release of emotions, which then make us feel better when we go after a movie. It's just a setup. And that's what we are doing here, too. We are taking this movie real. We are, we are getting rid of much higher emotions at the place where we are sleeping. But this movie is even more interesting than the movie we see there on the screen. They try to make it interesting by make it a 3D movie. Now it looks like things are moving towards us also, not only on the screen. And I probably mentioned to you about the 3D movie in which a truck was carrying all those mice. And you remember I told first day how the mice were released and they all came into the feet of the audience. Everybody raised their feet. It was all on the screen. Nothing had come out. And then they had put some air pumps at the seats. Everybody actually felt the mice are there. Then there are some stink bombs there. Such a stink. Everybody held their nose. Oh, these mice are creating it. How can you make a reality out of such an illusion? Experience was real. Things were not. It's the same truth out here. That is why... I told, sometimes tell the story of an Indian boy, village, village boy, who had uh, never seen a movie. And this city boy said, have you seen a movie? He said, I don't know what it is. I'll come and show you. So he went and took him to a theater for a movie. In that movie, the, a scene comes where a girl is out to have a bath in a pond outside. And as she takes off her clothes, this young boy from the village gets very excited to see her naked. But before she takes the clothes that she's taking off, a train comes in front. And by the time the train goes, the girl is in the water. He went 20 times to that movie, <laughs> hoping one day the train will be late. <laughs> and we are watching the movie the same way, hoping for so many things to happen. They will happen what has been recorded. Nobody in a movie theater ever has looked backward to see where the light is, where the projector, where the film is loaded, when was the film shot and it was loaded there. Nobody. We look in front. We don't look back. And that is why we take it as real. If we looked back, we say this is just a celluloid film, there's still pictures being shown rapidly. And there's a light behind it which is casting a shadow in front. Where's the big deal? Where's the reality of it? We'd find out the truth. The same truth we can find out about this movie. That the light is inside. Light of our soul. That the movie has been prepared much earlier when we picked up a DVD from the causal plane with the mind. And the mind has that movie complete ready. That we are with the light projecting it on a 
multi-dimensional screen we call this physical world of space and time. And this is what we are seeing. And it's just a movie. If you go in, you'll find out it's a movie. If you don't go in, it looks real. And we have shut off our own awareness of our own self. How the movie was shot, forget. Bury it in the memory. Don't, if you remember, it'll no longer be a movie. So we can't remember when the movie was shot. Okay, we don't remember if it is loaded in a projector or not. We don't know the projector. We don't know the light. We don't know nothing, only the movie. It become real. What a wonderful way to make life real. And not only we make it real, the other movies we can still, once in a while, <coughs> a bad scene comes, you can close your eyes and not see. If a sad scene comes, you cry, you can take a handkerchief and wipe your tears. I cry in movies, by the way. <laughs> I don't cry in life. And my children, if they are with me in the movie, they find there's a sad scene, they carry extra handkerchiefs for me <laughs> so I can wipe my tears. And they wonder, why do you cry in the movies? I say, take them as more real in li life. I can't find the difference. The, the real thing is that we deliberately suppressed to create re reality. Every level of reality has been created on the same principle. Our dreams are created like that. This dream, wakeful state is created like that. Astral stage is created like that. Causal state is created like that. The souls are created like that. Totality, the dreamer is only one. Now you can understand how the many came from the one for the sake of diversified experiences, which should be real experiences. And that's how the reality has been created. It's, it's remarkable to find the truth of this statement. I'm just making a statement. The truth can be verified by going within. It's all happening from within outward. It's not happening any other direction. This whole experience is being generated from the right inside outward. And the inside is everything. The whole universe is inside. The creator is inside. God is inside. We are inside. Everything is inside. But the, the projector has projected it outside. At least three levels have been projected outside. Maybe four levels. If you consider a dream that we have at night is one level. This wakeful state another level. Sensory state. The sensory state is interesting because it is different. The experience is different. Experience in dream is different than here. For example, in a dream, you can be sitting in Rice Lake now, and next second, you can be sitting in Chicago, third, you're sitting in London. It looks absolutely normal. In a dream, scenes change so fast. Locations change so fast. It is perfectly normal. Nobody has ever questioned why is it happening like that. It happens in the phys physical world. We we'll wonder why it's happening. Dream is taken for granted. In dream, we compress time in such a way that in a short time, we can have a long experience. We, I discovered this when I came in 1960s to study in this country in a university, and I found there were a lot of sleep institutes. They were examining what dreams are, why they come, and what is sleep. Is sleep really going into another dimension? Or is it merely recollection of memories? Can it reveal more than, is it really a land somewhere? Today even they're examining that when we have dreams and see new things, where are they? Where are they coming from? Is there a se separate place from where dreams come? Scientists are examining this. So when I was with this sleep institute, I remember they used to have subjects who would sleep, they had cameras to see the rapid eye movement of the eyelids, and rapid eye movement showed what kind of dream they are having. And they would also see the other excitement going on by seeing different scenes, when does the blood pressure go up, when does the breathing become loud, heart palpitation become strong, with dreams only. And they had all the data that was being gathered all based on the dreams. And they, I remember a case. There were several cases like that, but I remember one I saw myself. They would, when the eyelids would move, if they moved vertically, they would wake up the 
subject. What are you dreaming? Oh, I was seeing a waterfall, beautiful waterfall in a mountain. The eyelids are moving this way. I wake up. What are you dreaming? I was seeing a tennis match. So the eyelids are moving, physical eyelids, physical eyes are moving in the direction of the dream. Then they see other body parts moving, legs moving, hands moving, and associating with what they are experiencing, they are totally unaware of the body. More interestingly, when they finally wake up, they are totally unaware of their dreams. They don't remember any dream. They say, we never dream. And everyone was dreaming. Every 15, 20 minutes, they saw dream. But one dream most fascinated that I w affected me was where a person was woken up to ask, what were you dreaming? He said, I dreamt that I was in school. I was a small child. I went to school. Then I met a girl. She, I fell in love with her. Then we grew up. And then we went to college. And then we got married. Then we had children. Then we went to abroad somewhere. Then we decided to settle down after we retire. And we settled down. I was very old. And then you woke me up. Whole life took seven minutes of dreaming. I dreamt only seven minutes. I did move only seven minutes. He had a whole dream of a life. So if somebody sent me a suggestion to see a movie called Inception. I don't know if you have seen any one of you. Inception. Has anybody seen? Yes. So, so many of you have seen it. Inception is about dreams. There they say you can dream within a dream and a third dream you can go. And they bring out this point there. I was surprised that they can, somebody had this idea that the time increases in a dream. From 10 minutes dream, you could make it an hour in the first dream, could make it 50 years in the second dream. That's the movie shows. And there is a wise man that these people have control of waking up. They keep some token, you know, in their hand and they can wake up with that. Actually, it causes some pain to them. Pain wakes us up. Even here, pain wakes us up. If somebody has no pain, they don't become a seeker. We have to have some kind of a pain. And when we dis are disappointed with something, we have pain. So pain is really what makes us seeker. Pain is what made those people wake up. And they arranged it to have pain, to wake up. They go to a third level. A lot of people are sleeping. And there's a wise man sitting there. And they said, have they come here to wake up? He says, no, they come here to sleep. That they desire. Time is short with them. They desire to live 50 years. They only have 10 minutes in real time. And do you know what we have in this dream? Zero time, and we create billions of years. We're just having succession of dreams. That's exactly what we are doing here. There's no difference. That's how time and space are being generated for diversification of experiences. I am sharing these things with you because many of you may be interested that what are we going to find out? Why is it worthwhile? People ask, <laughs> why should we meditate? What, what's the benefit? And the benefit is you will know the reality. If you're curious, if you're pain, if you're disappointed, it's good to have it, have an escape back to your true home. The second benefit is that while you are here, you get some peripheral benefits, side benefits, such as you don't get angry. You solve many problems if you don't get angry. You don't get the same lustful feeling that you've been having. Makes a difference to your life. You don't have the same kind of possessiveness, same kind of greed. Makes life like watching a movie. Changes you so much and the net result is makes you happy, very happy, happy 24-7. A big peripheral advantage. There's a search for happiness everywhere going on. Here's a side benefit of meditation that gives you that happiness. So that's why it's worthwhile even for a side benefit, even if you don't believe anything else, try that out. So that is why I would say from all points of view, this practice of meditation to find the truth within yourself is a useful thing. 
Now, I said to you in the morning session when we ended that we should develop our spiritual will so that it does not remain subservient to the mental will, which it is today. And I said you should say no to the mind. But before you can do that, you would know where your spirit is, where your soul is, and soul is inside. Where is the mind? Also inside. How do you communicate with each other? You communicate by you being silent and listening and the mind speaking. Always by thinking. Okay? This is not only a statement I'm making, it's an experience which you will soon have. I'll make you sit back there. You be the listener only. If you start thinking or speaking, then you are the mind. If you only listen, then you are the soul. Mind does not listen, soul does not speak. Very clear distinction. So if you sit at the third eye center and just keep quiet and listen, what will you listen? You listen to your mind. Mind will not stop talking, but don't direct the mind what to say or what to think. Just quietly listen what the mind is saying. If you are able to achieve that even for 10 minutes, you will know which is the mind which is you. So that's, why, that's an important exercise. Not many people do it. That's why they're confused. That they are thinking, the soul is thinking, soul is telling this. Soul doesn't tell. Soul doesn't speak. Soul listens. When it wants to tell, it can use the mind. It's its own spiritual will. And that's why it's a good idea to know that we are the listeners and there's a mind placed in us which is the speaker and we can go sit quietly and listen to the <laughs> mind and see if we don't tell the mind what to think, what does it think on its own? What are the arbitrary thoughts it picks up from old memories, from new creativity, so-called creativity, what new ideas it picks up, how does it say those things? And some of those things may look very bizarre to you. Most people tell me when we allow the mind to think without our guidance, it looks so bizarre because it doesn't know how to make sense of what it's saying. And we try to intervene and try to put things, and then the mind tells us what to do. We don't know what to tell the mind. We don't know our spiritual will. We get trapped. But let's have this experiment, this experience of merely listening and watching the mind. Mind can create thoughts which can be listened to, mind can create images which you can see, soul can see and listen. We think we are speaking, trying to make sense, using logic, and all we are doing is to use this machine of ours that is installed in us for good purpose, that our will, what we really want to do as souls, this listening part should direct the mind to do that. It's a very good, very good slave and servant if you give directions to it. Very bad master who tells you what to do. And we are using that bad master and following it. Just change that and let your own will, the intuitive will that comes without thinking, that you know what is to be done and without thinking you know it. Follow that. Make the mind follow that in your life and you'll be finding much happier. Why is that? Because when mind tells us something, it tells us from the data, knowledge available to it at that time, which is very limited. It can't remember everything that ever happened. It can remember a few things and uses that memory to guide us what to do. It's incomplete data. That is why when we listen to a thought, plan something, next day doesn't work, we ourselves say, I wish I had listened to my gut feeling of that time. So many people have told me how they later on find out what they had, a first thought, first intuition, without first <laughs> thinking about it, that turned out to be right, and what the mind was advising was incomplete. There's a reason for that. The reason is intuition telling us what to do in physical life is not based upon the current information we have in the mind. 
it's based on totality of information that is stored in the mind. It picks up from there. It uses entire storage of all stored information to give guidance. That is why they say these old people, they just intuitively tell you, do this, when they're called wise people. Wisdom is that they do not use too much thinking of local data. They use the total data stored in their minds and give because that comes only suddenly, intuitively. That's the difference between intuition and how does the intuition decide? After it's picking up from somewhere, it's picking up from to total stored data. And total stored data includes data which is for several lifetimes, includes our own experiences of several lifetimes, includes unfulfilled desires, unpaid karma of several lifetimes, which is stored in what we call the sinjit karma, also stored in the mind. And thinking has no ac access to it, intuition has. Even instincts have. A big difference between instincts and intuition. We all are acting instinctively, and we say it's all stored on our DNA molecule. A DNA molecule is a physical representation of what is stored on the mind. And what is stored on a DNA molecule as you very well know, that there are DNA molecules in every cell of the body. But there are DNA cells in the brain, brain structure, which are different <coughs> from those in the skin. And the difference arises from the chromosomes, if you are interested in the, uh, in the biology of it, or the body physics of it. The DNA cells do not all operate the same way. Some operate as commanders, some operate as followers. And what makes one a commander and one a follower is how many of the chromosomes are open. These are like windows which give them more information which they can use. So that is why skin cells with two, two only open, they'll follow directions given by the nervous system from inside. Nerves will follow through the spine coming from the brain. Only one cell, they say, maybe one cell sitting in the center of the brain, in what they call the pineal gland in anatomy, has a cell, all 46 doors open, windows open, and is a controller of all other cells, sends messages to the nervous system, sends messages to hormonal systems. Hormones are ductless gland, and they are generated from the pineal gland. They're all functioning under one gland. And we have never been able to fully realize about the location of the pineal gland. It's right at the third eye center. The pituitary body and the pineal gland, they, they are slightly on the side of it. They are exactly where we are describing the third eye center. Phys in the physiology of the human body, in the physiology itself we find that the things are functioning as replicas, as stored, physical representations of what is actually happening in the sensory systems and the mind. They're all contained right here as copies of it. So that is why the intuitive self is picking up from there that all doors are open. The other cells are open and depending upon thinking about some part of our, mind, of our body, our experiences outside, and it's limited. It's a very interesting uh, thing to examine that we are using a far wider base of information when we use intuition and a very small base when we use thinking. So that's why the spiritual will, become, uh, spiritual will becomes far more important in daily life than our mental will. And we can, as I said in the mo morning, we can develop our spiritual will. Meditation develops by itself because meditation is taking us, withdrawing our attention to third eye center, and that's a center, that's a place, even in the body, where you have the whole collection of things from where it travels all over the body, and from the body through energy centers, travels all over the world. So that is why it's very useful. Meditation itself will develop it, and if you start to learn to say no with the mind, telling the mind, using spiritual will, no three, four times a week, and then three, four times a day, automatically mind will go back into its proper role. 
of assisting you in having diversified experience instead of controlling you for what to do. So it's a very good exercise. I am happy I shared all this information with you. We took a few seconds, maybe a couple of minutes sometimes for these meditation sessions. Too short a time to be able to test out something. This should be done at least half an hour, one hour to really get the benefit of this. This is a workshop to train us how to do it. We, we are not meditating fully here, but does not mean that you have to leave it here, go back home, test it out more. Spend more time on meditation. Carry out what you learned and spend more time. For beginners, we were told that we need to do at least two hours repeating words before we can think of hearing the sound. Two hours every day. And when we begin to hear even little sound, at least half an hour to start with. As we grow and hear the sound better, we can drop the repetition to one hour, one and a half hour sound. When we drop the sound, uh, repetition altogether, only sound. Both of these things can be made into a continuous habit in the body. Repetition of words, Simran, Mantra, if you repeat it all the time, not only during meditation, while walking, moving, doing things, cooking, whatever you're doing, if you're repeating them and make your mind repeat it more than the tongue, the mind makes up a habit. Mind is habit forming. And it forms a habit of repeating them. And once it forms a habit, you don't have to repeat, mind will do it for you. You can wake up in the middle of the night and you'll see your mind repeating. That means you made it a habit. That this becomes a very easy thing. Similarly, when you hear the sound regularly, the sound will come even when you're not meditating. It becomes regular. So meditation, mechanical part of meditation, which we did for two days, becomes a habit and automatic. But the other part, love and devotion, spiritual part, you can do whenever you feel like it. And if you remember the beloved all the time, you are fully meditating all the time. Great Master was asked by a disciple, how much meditation should we do? He said, preferably all the time. But we, don't, we can't do it all the time. Let us do it only for 23 and a half hours, 22 and a half hours. We have to leave two and a half hours for mental activity and we have to give attention to outside things. Somebody said, how can you do 22 and a half hours? You even recommend to people to do two and a half hours, one tenth of your time. How are we going to make it 22 and a half hours? He said, very simple. Then he explained that if you can make your repetition into a habit, you are meditating day and night. And if you are remembering your beloved, you are uh, uh, meditating all the time. Only when you have to put your whole attention on some intellectual business. And he says, even people working in very intellectual jobs, it's not all the time that they put atten serious attention. Two and a half hours is enough for that. Then you're meditating 23 and a half hours. He was also asked by an American disciple of his, how often should we come and see you? He said, you should see me 24-7 inside. No, but if we can't see you inside, and we can only see you outside, then how often? He said, the best is to see outside also daily, at least once a day. He said, I live in the United States, in America. How can I come every day to see? I have to do my business there. He said, if somebody is not living with me or near me, in the Dera, they used to say, then once a week is all right. And I remember when this conversation took place with that American disciple. My grandfather was also there. When he heard that, for the rest of his life, he went every weekend to see the great master. He said, he said that's the minimum required. Then the disciple said, what if people are sitting far away and they can't afford to come? It costs money to come there. He said, then once a month it should be good enough. What about people living overseas who can't visit you like that? Then once a year is good enough. They come once a year. Uh, but master supposing somebody cannot come once a year. Then he smiled and said, there's another next life available. <laughs> no problem. So that is why these are, what is the importance of these things? 
importance is we are tackling a nice servant given to us who has become our enemy, our mind. We are tackling a mind. Can you imagine? We come here, we get together, and we decide we are going to meditate every day. And after a few days, we are doing something else. Have you ever decided, I am never going to do this? And again, done it. Please raise your hand. Everybody. And I'll tell you a little story. Don't you like stories? So one more story, OK. The story is about two hunters who were elk hunters, elks in the mountains. So they would take a plane, a small plane, go elk hunting and hunt one or two elks and bring them. Once they hunted and killed four elks, and they dragged the elks to the plane, it's a small plane. The pilot said, you cannot take four of them together because they're too heavy. This plane will crash. <coughs> they said, last year we took four. What, what you, same plane, same size plane, and we took four. So what makes you say we can't take four? He said, look, they're heavy, I can tell you. But they dragged the elks, all the four, put them on the plane, and naturally the plane crashed. Out of the debris of the plane, one or two of them, they survived. The pilot died. The elks were already dead. They got out, and one asked the other, where are we? The other man says, same place we were last year. <laughs> <laughs> they were just like us, raising hands. <laughs> that, what I'm proving is that our mind is such that no matter how much we decide to do something, the mind can take us astray. Mind likes diversion, mind likes to distract us. And that is why when we get together back, we go back on track. So that is why the more often we can afford to get together, more often we can come back on track is worthwhile. I understand that there are a few questions some of you have written. So if Jonathan has those questions, try to answer a few. Is the crooked tunnel where the soul and mind unite or separate? It has to be understood that they can never be separate. If the soul separates from the mind, mind dies. If the soul separates from the body, body dies. If the soul separates from senses, senses die. Nothing can survive without the soul. Soul is necessity for life. That is why soul is always there. What has been described as the crooked tunnel, or banknal, they say in India, is a, is a station between the astral and the causal plane. It happens to be at that point where you can have a vision of both. You can have experience of the astral and the causal. It's not unique to that place only. Even when we go within, in the very first stage of going to the astral plane, there are two parts of the astral plane. One connected with the physical, and one not connected with the physical. When we go into a state of forgetting our body, which we go in the dreams also, dreams are created on a different pattern. When we go by meditation into the higher state, we can still see this world. And we were, on the first day I said, would you like to fly? You fly, I said, see down there, down below is the earth. It's the same earth that we're living in here. The connection between the physical and the astral experiences. Sensory perceptions exist, and the perceptions can still see the same <laughs> experience like physical. When you go to the upper part of astral plane, it's a totally different world. We're not connected with this. Here we have their own universes, we have own places, own galaxies, own populations, own people, and much longer lives of the people, living very differently, Knowledge is instantly acquired from books. There are no books like that, but they are libraries of knowledge. They are very different life experience from which we have copied the experiences in the physical plane. So that is why that there's, there is a position which both can occur together. Between the astral and the causal plane, 
you can have this there's a section of that experience when you fly into it it looks like you can also see the astral and also see the causes and that is called the crooked tunnel because it's crooked in the sense that till you reach the middle of that point you can't see both but when you reach the middle of that point you see both so that's what's called crooked it is not straight that you can see all the way through you only see in the middle of the tunnel both sides so supposing you have a tunnel made in like l shaped the middle you can see both sides from there but any other point you'll only see one so that's an internal experience that happen and the soul is always there it's a it is a place where these astral and causal planes meet you might have heard in the bible stories they talk of jesus going and serving 5000 people or 50000 people two fish and people wonder how could he feed thousands of people with two fish did he break them into little pieces there is no description of how he distributed <coughs> two fish but now look at the actual structure actual structure of the physical universe where we are sitting here this is space and time how big is the space infinite on which direction all directions supposing infinity is a number and the space is at the same number all over what will it look like big sphere it will become a sphere and it is a sphere it's an infinite sphere still spherical what is the astral plane also a sphere bigger sphere but where do we have experience of both where they overlap and one sphere merges in the other now if part of the sphere is merging it looks like a fish absolutely like a fish it's a three dimensional fish the place where the two merge is described like a fish overlap same overlap is there between the astral plane and the causal plane makes another fish this is the description of our ascent into these levels of awareness and he gave that information to them through the description of the two fish and we are thinking he might have caught the fish from the pond and distributed to people is symbolic it's not that he actually took the fish out he describing something that from a upper vision looks like two fish where the overlaps meet and the bunk nal or the crico tunnel is in the second fish one more question if my mind brings in images which cannot be made to speak mantra how about making the mind's image switch over to a view of the master other images will come and what we get how we get to get the master's image inside in meditation is through memory no other way no imagination no speculation all mental speculation is mental is not a image of the master master the image is you have physically seen the master and remember when you saw the master and when you want to bring the image remember the actual event when you saw the master everybody can bring it up as a memory recall that you met the master where you met where you saw what was he looking like what was he doing what were you doing what was the location bring it up when you bring that up the master comes and you recall what he said at that time then the master will start speaking further as if he is present there it does not happen immediately it takes a little practice but when you want to bring the image of the master it has to be brought from an actual living memory and that is why we need a perfect living master only perfect living master when we meet with our own eyes see with our own eyes can do proper contemplation the fourth most important part of meditation but if we have never seen the master you can't do the fourth part meditation is incomplete it doesn't take you very far that is why the dhyan part the contemplation part is by actually recalling 
how you saw the master. Anybody can recall. Not trying to make up. Other images will slide away when you're remembering something. Even any, any, everything else you remember, other images slide away. So when you remember your actual meeting with the master, the images slide away, the master image stays there. One more question. One of the reasons that I began seeking the truth is to understand depth and what happens to us. My biggest fear was not necessarily hell, but utter non-existence. In our true home is the annihilation of self and loss of my sense of being. Answer is exactly the opposite. You discover yourself in your true home, which you have no idea of right now. You discover more of yourself when you wake up further into higher levels of awareness, which you don't have any idea now. Everything else gets annihilated, the self remains. And self is the only truth, self is the only creative power, and you get a true knowledge of what your self is, what your being is. Nothing is annihilated. Thank you very much for your patient listening.